So another topic, and this is something we get asked about, I mean, honestly, multiples of every other question is, how do I get into investment banking? How do I get into private equity? How do I get into a hedge fund? And so two questions that we got that were similar that I think we can try to tackle this broader topic were, A, is there mobility into hedge funds or banks if you're 10 plus years into a career in tech startups? And then B, the second question that we got was, how can JD grads, so people who've graduated with their law degree, how can they break into the financial services industry? Hopefully we can give some general advice today that you can understand as being applicable to wherever you may be if you're not necessarily coming from, okay, I knew the second I was born that I wanted to be a banker and I've been doing everything ever since to prepare. So there are so many people out there right now who know that is their path and these are the people that you'll be competing with. So you need to get increasingly creative and figure out different ways to compete if you're coming from these, what we call non-traditional paths. And if you guys have asked us this question, you'll probably notice that one of our first answers is always like, have you reached out to the alums from your school? Yeah. And because people say, I didn't go to a target school. Okay, but is there anyone from your school who has made their way through this industry? If so, they are gonna be your biggest advocates, your best mm -hmm. resource, because they have that natural connection to you, right? Even, even we who are just starting out, we get hundreds of messages on LinkedIn from people being like, hey, can you help me? Can you help me? So imagine if we were like actually people who mattered, who like had <laughs> prestigious careers and had hedge funds or private equity. Imagine how many messages those people get being like, hey, give me a job, right? If they're sorting through all those messages and they see yours and it's from someone from their college and saying, hey, we're in the same dorm or whatever. Yeah. It, there is that automatic connection that you have that is mm -hmm. going to make that person at least feel some kind of I don't know if I want to call it an obligation to or sympathy for or empathy for you above everyone else who might be shooting emails their way. And I um, think too, if you're someone who is at a non-target school and you have an alum who is at a bank that you're interested in, they know how much harder it was for them and they probably want to give back and they want to help. So the name of the game is to reach out to alums because they are the way that you are going to get Right. And I oh, talked about LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is still relatively anonymous and passive. If you can get these people's email addresses, if you can get their phone numbers, anything like that, that goes so much further. It's not creepy. It really isn't. Although I feel like it is weird because if you get a call from someone you don't know, I'm always like, oh, someone's calling me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't text me first to tell me they were going to call me. But uh, you are a salesperson and also like a real estate agent. So you're like just getting calls all the people. time. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, and, and to be fair, like when we started recording this podcast today, I got a call from a number that tricked me. I was a solicitor, but I was like, hello, like you want to <laughs> buy or sell a house? Thinking like someone was calling me about business. So I don't mind the phone calls. I don't mind the text messages. If you're really trying to break into this industry and you have something to offer and you're ambitious and hardworking. Now, if you're going to call the cell phone of a portfolio manager at a hedge fund and be like, Hey, get me a job. You better have a lot to back that up. You better <laughs> have an exciting story. You better have a lot of questions. So don't go into this cold, but definitely start there. <laughs> and let's, and let's back up and talk about the two scenarios that were brought to us. We've got a tech entrepreneur and someone who has now graduated with their law degree. So our tech entrepreneur who's been working at some tech startup for 10 years. We talked a little bit about this with Steve Haggerty last week on our interview episode. Steve transitioned from his career in the automotive industry into being a sector specialist in equity research. And then he ultimately transferred his skills from equity research on the sell side to equity research on the buy side. All right. In-depth knowledge of an industry sector, that can be a huge asset. But you have to take the fact that you are an expert in this one tiny widget and figure out how to take that and extrapolate from that why are you are now qualified to be in the financial services industry, reflecting back on that specific sector. So if you want to try to position yourself that way, that is one way that can work to your advantage. It might not be an instantaneous conversion. So again, the equities research angle could be great. It might not work. And you might need to do something else to bolster the fact that you want to work in the financial services industry. So that's where, listen, we've talked about how valuable they are, how valuable they might not be towards a career in the financial services industry. Something like an MBA might work to well, your advantage yeah. to help you build For the right network. Yeah. And to get you kind of like the credentials on your resume that say, hey, listen, I am generally interested in finance. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, I was going to say for career switchers, an MBA is super valuable. 
because it gets you into the recruiting cycle. It gets you into a, a an associate class. You literally have banks that have hundreds of spots that are devoted right. to filling an associate class. And now right. you are applying for one of a hundred versus one of one, like a- you know, <laughs> Or zero, hun- right. Sorry, you're, hundreds you're of one to, to zero. Yeah. Yeah. You're asking them to create a seat for you out of thin air being well, on but your off recruiting cycle. That's very difficult. Right. You're applying for a job and you're against people that have tons of experience. Like with the associate right. class, you're coming in and they are expecting people don't have the experience. Maybe they had the internship as part of their MBA summer, but they don't have experience and that's fine. And so if you go through, say, an MBA and then you're getting into the recruiting cycle, now you have that background in tech and that actually is a huge asset. So they right. would love that. But when you're just going in cold, it definitely can be a little harder. It doesn't mean it can't be done and people definitely right. do it all the time. And again, back to the whole alumni thing or friends who work in that industry. I mean, there are ways to potentially get in, but to gen- you have to be more creative. Actually, I was listening to a podcast and uh, <laughs> that's like how I begin every sentence. I was, listening to a I, podcast. I was listening to a podcast though and they were talking about how there are more hedge funds than Burger Kings now. And so wow. you, has get the money. you yeah, get you a hedge fund. <laughs> no, but I mean, the, whether it is a smaller hedge fund, a smaller, pro, you know, venture cap, like a lot of these types of positions, they're going to want to be hiring people. If you have someone who's literally starting their own fund and they're an alum at your school, it makes it a little easier. So it um, really does. And it also depends on what kind of position you had at that tech startup. Okay. Were mm-hmm. you a leader and like part of the executive team? Were you the visionary who came up with this idea for whatever hairbrushes.com <laughs> or were you a coder? That makes a big difference in terms of like the marketable skill set that you are bringing to the table. Okay. And not that those aren't both valuable skill sets. If you were a thought leader and part of the executive team, then you have a better understanding of the corporate finance side of that tech startup. If you were a coder, you probably fit in with the quants who are building models either on the buy side or the sell side. So it just, it really depends on what your day-to-day was like in that career. And that is going to determine what your kind of what your tiny inroads will be as that expands. And let's tackle our attorney's question because there is so much intersection between the legal world and the financial services industry. You know that saying like behind every great man, there's a, (laughs) you know, woman pulling this. Should be, it should be. There's the, 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 it it now needs to be behind every great woman. There is a man who's helping her out. (laughs) Changing this. Exactly. But like behind all of these bankers doing something, there is a legal team on all fronts of the bank, either making sure they're not breaking the law or advising them on like the legal consequences of what they are proposing to their clients. So Mm -hmm. there are legal teams underlying all aspects of the bank. And then there is the GC level at the sweet C-suite level, who's advising the bank on its overall corporate strategy. Bank or by the way, hedge fund, you get a hedge fund, you get a hedge. There's tons of positions in all these. Yeah. Asset yeah. manager, all of these people have legal teams. So if you're a JD who wants to be in the financial services world, you can still use the things that you've studied. Like yeah. you don't have to totally switch gears. Now, if you do want to totally switch gears, it still might not be the worst idea in the world to start with the existing skills that you have. Like you mm-hmm. can start on the legal team and in a lot of legal seats, you will be interfacing with PL generating roles and some of them you won't. But once you're at the firm, it's not such a crazy thing for you to send an email over to, I don't know, Miss Associate Salesperson in rates and be like, hey, you seem nice. Can I come <laughs> sit behind you for a day? Like I have this day off, but I'm actually going to use it to learn. And I guarantee you, Miss Wonderful Associate in Sales might be like, yeah, totally. Jen? I don't care. Come sit behind me. Like, you know, I, I, I did things like this for people within the firm who were curious to try different things out. This is not unheard of. This actually happens. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes as a person in a PL generating seat, you will meet people like this through like networking events or just through like the everyday course of business. And that's how people, you know, from middle markets, from back office, we used to be like, there's this awesome girl in middle markets and we got to get her up or like in middle office or whatever it was, we got to get her to the front lines. And then like, it would turn out, she'd be like, nope, I don't want that. Like, (laughs) (laughs) please do not promote me into that role. There's a reason I don't want to do it. Like, or or it could be like an awesome opportunity. So that's, that's definitely one way in. But I mean, my dad started his career as an attorney and actually it was a perfect natural transition for him to go into investment banking. He was doing municipal advisory. 
And it was like, well, somebody needs to advise all of these municipalities on the legal consequences of the funds that they are issuing, of the debt that they're raising. Yeah. And so it was a perfect crossover. And sometimes the lawyers know a lot more about the nitty gritty of this stuff than the bankers do. The bankers are just like, okay, up, down, left, right, right. And the lawyers are like, well, did you consider like an article G, section B? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so that's one path. The other yeah. path is if you work at, let's say, a law firm that specializes in, I don't know, securities law or mergers and acquisitions, okay, that is a great opportunity to build a skill set that is directly transferable and position yourself for a switch. You're going to build those relationships with the sell side. You may find that you don't necessarily want to go backwards in your career after having been senior enough to be directly advising on those deals. So right. that's something to take into consideration because you might have to take a step backwards in your career, it's, not without risk. Right, 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 right. 